To quickly move on to our next speaker, I'm delighted to be able to announce Senator Cory Bernardi, who I know for many of our attendees is one of the highlights of this conference as part of our other amazing speakers. To those who might not particularly know Cory well, you, and who might only know Senator Bernardi by the caricature that is sometimes made of him in the Fairfax Press and in the ABC, you might ask, why do we have Senator Bernardi addressing a conference of classical liberals? The answer to this is very, very simple. Because on virtually every issue, Senator Bernardi has proven himself to be on the side of liberty in the Australian Parliament. This does not necessarily mean we agree with him on all things. Like all people involved in politics, there are issues where we may disagree upon. But on the issues that matter, both on economics and in other areas, he has proven himself to be somebody who is well thought, who, who, sorry, who three, thinks through the issues is deeply thought, well read, particularly on economics, and has a proven commitment to reducing the size of government. Prior to taking the leadership of the Australian Conservatives as part of as a Liberal Senator for South Australia, he was one of the few who frequently spoke out against the party when the Liberal Party wanted to increase taxes or when the Liberal Party wanted to increase spending. He was a standard bearer for causes such as repealing Section 18C and restoring free speech to Australia, and of course was one of, the one of the people responsible for the repeal of the tax on carbon dioxide. On issues such as transparency, we are glad that he has been one of the champions of the Australian Taxpayers Alliance cause of transparency and our right to know how our taxes are being spent. And any of us who have read his blog and frequent writings for many years would know his commitment to economic principles of small government. Now, Senator Bernardi, being the leader of a party called the Australian Conservatives, is not always, um, you know, a, is not obviously a classical liberal. But people here might know that he actually lost the mantle to being a conservative when he, at, in Chicago, at two o'clock in the morning at a bar, had a push-up contest with John Humphreys over what was correct conservatism or libertarianism, and Senator Bernardi lost said contest. <laughs> there are, however, two other interesting points from this night that I think you might find amusing. The first of which was when Senator Bernardi was denied entry into a bar because he, the bounce had, he didn't have ID on him to prove that he was 21 years old or over. <laughs> And the second one, if the Senator doesn't mind me mentioning, is this, we were deep involved in a political conversation, at which point um, this young, attractive uh, female walked up, took Senator Bernardi's hand, which was in his pocket at the time, looked at the wedding ring, went, oh, damn, and walked off. <laughs> On that note, please, everyone, warmly welcome Senator Bernardi. That's, that's all on the record for my wife to watch, I'm sure. It's funny, you know, there was, there was a term unreconstructed leftist used earlier today. So you've got an unreconstructed leftist, a libertarian and a conservative, they walk into a bar and the barman said, what will it be, Mr Turnbull? <laughs> It is a great pleasure actually to be here uh, today. As I was walking in, uh, I met a young chap and uh, we started talking and he said, you know, how is it that a conservative needs to come to a libertarian conference to, to feel good and to be, feel part of it? Um, but there is so much in common and Tim touched upon it. And, uh, you know, when the Australian Taxpayers Alliance was first conceived and John Humphreys was there in Chicago as well, uh, we had spirited debates about what the country needed. And um, so I support what you're doing here because we do need more freedom. We need more uh, people that are prepared to run as hard as they can at the, uh, the current zeitgeist, if you will, and say there's got to be a better way. I've done that myself by forming my own party, far from what Tim described as I've seized the leadership of the Australian Conservatives. Um, it was a pretty narrow race, if I may say so. <laughs> But it's growing. Now I have uh, three factions because there's three parliamentary members. That's not true <laughs> at all. We're absolutely at one. Uh, but it was in America that, you know, the, the libertarian ethos and the libertarian spirit really uh, became very clear to me and, and about how much we do have in common as those who are self-described conservatives like me and those who describe themselves as libertarians. And as I look around, I see David Leinhelm. Uh, I should acknowledge you as my parliamentary colleague. David. Uh, is a true libertarian. He is someone who is entirely, <laughs> who is entirely principled in his pro approach. And I, I liken it to saying 
that David and I, in our own respective manners, are, are predictable. Uh, when you go to David, you, you get a fair idea. If you're asking him to vote for tax increases, that's not going to happen. If you ask him to uh, you know, deregulate the economy, that is probably likely to get your support. So um, I salute David Lineham, who's a flag bearer for all of you. And uh, we have much in common and we work very well together. So thank you, for David. But it was in America that my formative sort of exposure to libertarianism started. And I was in America last year as well uh, for three months on secondment to that libertarian group called the United Nations. Um, there's a great deal of liberty to agree with everything they say or to be frozen out and ostracised. And it was there I met that other great uh, provocateur, uh, Ezra Levant, who uh, was banned by the United Nations until he met me and I managed to get him in to uh, take him on a tour. And then he got banned after that for taking footage in the Security Council and standing at the podium lecturing the United Nations on a variety of things. Um, it was a great experience and I never felt less welcome at the UN after that. But, and I was there, of course, for the Trump campaign as well, which was fascinating in itself. Uh, to see the polarisation of politics, the cheerleading that goes on through the media, uh, to see, you know, the, the, the moribund status, quite frankly, of the, of the uh, Republican Party and their traditional candidates versus the expectancy of, you know, the, um, the president-elect before the election in Hillary Clinton. And the contrast between the two candidates was stark. Uh, the, you had Hillary Clinton who wanted uh, pan-hemispheric open borders and you, wanted, you had Donald Trump who said he wanted to make sure their borders were safe and secure. Clinton who wanted business as usual and tax increases, Trump who wanted tax reductions and uh, deregulation of the economy. Uh, people often say that you know, Clinton uh, was more about open trade, but Trump's contrast, and I choose to see it like this, was that he wanted to ensure that the trade deals that were in existence for America were actually acting in America's advantage. And I don't see anything wrong with that in the sense that no one in government, or sorry, in business, goes in to negotiate a, a contract in perpetuity. The only person I know who ever did that was the guy in America who did a deal with the Russian government, uh, um, I think under Gorbachev, to have the continuing rights for the Stolix Naya vodka brand in America. He had that in perpetuity uh, through some deals with the Russian government. Uh, he ended up making billions of dollars out of the Russians as a result. Um, I don't think that's good for any business, except for the person on the per perpetual side of the thing. So I support Donald Trump in that. And when I returned, a journalist said to me, you know, you were a, a supporter of, the, of, uh, of Donald Trump. And I said, that's right. And they said, well, how can you support, you know, for the highest office in the land, a bloke who's made enormous amounts of money through questionable means. A bloke that despite having a smoking hot wife, that's my term, a smoking hot wife is a noted philanderer. A person that has allegations of misogynistic behaviour and suggestions of substance abuse. How can you support a person like that? And I said, well, look, I've never supported JFK. Um, <laughs> it was a very short interview. <laughs> but nothing to see here, let's move along. Um, but you know, JFK, one of the stories that goes around is that he, during the NASA first moon project, went into, on a tour of NASA and he saw this bloke sweeping the floor and he said, hey, what do you do here? And this bloke who was sweeping the floor said, look, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. And, uh, you know, whether that story is true or not, it resonates. Because everything that we all do, whether we could describe ourselves as conservatives or libertarians, whatever we do individually is going to make a contribution to the freedom agenda. And it is much more necessary now than, than in my living memory. We're not fighting a Cold War, although that may arise in the future. We're not fighting a Cold War. We're fighting a war, a battle against our own government. And to be honest, it doesn't matter. It doesn't seem to matter which stripe of government it is. What we know is the status quo is not working for us. It works for government. And there are some statistics I dug out through the IPA, another great organisation about history. If you go back in Australia's history from 1901, you know, tax as a percentage of GDP then was 4.9%. In 1983, 
after, uh, after the, the Whitlam years and the election of the Hawke government, it was 27.3% of GDP. And in 2012, it wasn't much better. It was 26.5% of GDP. Now, that's simply too high. If you look at legislation, unsurprisingly, in 1901 at Federation, it was pretty minimal. It was about 1,852 pages of legislation. And it didn't have that big an increase, relatively. In 1983, it was about 10,676 pages of legislation. So let's just say it's a five or six-fold increase in that, in that uh, span of eight decades. But now it's 25, in excess of 25,000 pages of legislation that are telling us how to live our lives. And yet the social problems, the cultural problems, the, 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 the dislocation and the disconnection that so many of us feel out here, maybe in this room, but outside in the community, hasn't been improved by the extra paperwork that comes our way. The public service, in, in 1901, it was 3.5% of the population. In uh, 1983, it was just over 10.5%. And in 2012, it was about 8.5%. So, you know, one in 10 or 12 working people, uh, uh, one in 10, 12 people in this country work in the public service. It is simply too high and it's not sustainable. And the result of all of this, the result is we have you know, social issues and cultural issues, but we have a budget issue. It is a huge issue. We have $550 billion worth of debt, which has been spent on public servants and recurring expenditure, notwithstanding there's been some infrastructure, but nothing of you know, a productivity improvement uh, notice. And that doesn't look like it's going to end soon. In fact, just as recently as last week, we were told there's good debt and bad debt. Uh, but what the debt means is that our children, some of you, will have to pay it all back. We are borrowing money today to sustain the unsustainable lifestyles that the Australian people are demanding of their government. And there are too few that are prepared to make the principled case about the moral obligation we have to get our budgetary house in order. And there's too few, both in the Labor Party and in the Liberal Party. On the crossbenches, there are too few who are prepared to say, no, we shouldn't do this. It is wrong, not only is it immorally wrong because of our obligations to future generations, it's wrong for today to make people even more dependent. And that's why I left the Liberal Party. Well, I didn't leave the Liberal Party, the Liberal Party left me. And I started the Australian Conservatives because I think it's important for us to have a principled approach to getting our house in order. And that's why I think I'm entirely predictable in this space. And so I've said, if you're, really, if you're serious about cleaning up Canberra and bursting that bubble and that disconnect, and if you're serious about, about ensuring our obligations to our, to our future generations are met, let's start by looking at Canberra itself. And you know, um, by, by simply holding the politicians to account and their public service masters, you could save six or seven hundred million dollars over the forward estimates. How do you do that? Well, every treasurer since Wayne Swan has said, you know, a surplus is just around the corner. You know, we're going to be next year and it's going to be next year and it's going to be now it's 2020, 2021, 2025. We won't see a surplus by the time, you know, I'm in government. But, or until I'm in government. <laughs> but, if you wanted to put, you put those, hold that people to the test, you could freeze politicians and public servant salaries until the policies that they prepare and they put into the parliament and all the advice they give actually delivers on what they promise. It would be $676 million over the forward estimates. Now, you might say it's not that much money. I think it's a fair bit still. But what it would do is sharpen the pencils of every public servant who says, here's your options and the politicians who you get to choose from them. They would mean they'd have to use realistic figures going forward. Um, I believe that we should have a transparency portal, and this is one of the things that I learned from Gover Norquist with Tim Andrews when I was in the States in 2009, <coughs> that if you want to hold the political class and the public servants who are spending your money to account, 
you've got to disclose how, much, how they spend their money. Now, we have a Senate estimates program. It doesn't work. It's like, you know, I'll ask the question, I know what the answer is, you know what the answer is, but you're not going to tell me because you might embarrass the minister. We've got to put to stop to the yoga classes and the gold plated coffee machines and the, you know, group hug therapy sessions and the, you know, let's all laugh and feel good about ourselves classes. That's what taxpayers' money has been spent on. And a transparency portal would go a huge way to ensuring that citizen journalists and every single one of us can go in and say, well, what was that $5,000 spent on? What was that $50,000 spent on? The hundreds of millions of dollars worth of consultants that we have to get freedom of information requests, which take months and are then denied, we need to know and we have an obligation to know and a right to know because government is riddled with waste and duplication. We need to stop that and we need to get our expenses, our percentage of uh, expenditure, government taxation and revenue uh, below you know, the 20% threshold if it possibly can for the maximum effectiveness. That means we've got to end, end the duplication. We've got to apportion the responsibilities between the states and the Commonwealth as our Federalist Fathers desired it to be. It shouldn't be for levels of government to pick up the pieces. One of the, the, the greatest things that I heard earlier today was that the more government does, the less civil society does. The voluntary associations that proved so effective in the construct of how society has evolved over the last several hundred years. Um, we cannot afford to let this drift any longer. I put it in terms of a moral context. And it's not about climate change, it's not about anything else, it is about we have an obligation to our future generations. I will survive whatever the government throws at me, I can promise you that. But our children won't necessarily do it. So we have to preserve our economic balance sheet. We have to make sure that our cultural balance sheet and our approach to what government is meant to do for us, the citizens of this country, is absolutely consistent and in our national interest. And that extends not just domestically, ladies and gentlemen, it extends internationally. The one thing that I have learned is that Australia plays a very important role on the international stage, but we should never, never suspend what is in our national interest and slavishly bow to the international demands of communities and countries who do not have our interests at heart at all. They're only interested in themselves. We have to start backing the team called self-interest. And it's for us as freedom lovers, as libertarians or conservatives, we are united as Australians. And that means we want to make sure we can get the best possible outcome for our country and put it on a sustainable path for decades to come. Thank you very much. I think I'm taking some questions and I think I've finished on time. Is that right? Good work. Thank you. Um, a really good question. I, the, the level of disillusionment with the major parties is at a recent high, I think. It's about 30% of people are looking out for other alternatives. The left of the political sphere have done amazingly well by getting themselves together and representing themselves as the Greens. Uh, the right of the political sphere, the conservative side of the, the, the political um, ideology, needs to do the same. It doesn't mean we're always going to agree on everything, but I do think we've got to bring disparate voices into a broader tent, a coalition, if you will, uh, an alliance to make sure that we can keep whatever government is elected as honest as they possibly can be. And that means reminding them of what a Liberal government, and I say the Liberal Party, a, a Liberal government is meant to be doing, keeping taxes low, keeping you know the government growth at a minimum, uh, making sure that we're helping the truly disadvantaged and uh, uh, giving everyone the opportunity to foster free enterprise. Um, a related question is from Nadia, who asks, after the to quit the Liberal Party, given your admiration of libertarian values, have you at any time contemplated joining forces with Senate Alliance and the Liberal Democrats? <laughs> um, well, Nadia, David never invited me. <laughs> I've had plenty of other overtures, but David, I have a fantastic working relationship with David on you know, the economic matters and the, and the matters of 
uh, that matter to many, the, the issues that matter to so many in this room. We, of course, have different views about, um, I think, some of the social issues that go along, and that's fine. I can respect difference. That's one of the great things about you know, our side of politics, if I can use it in that way. But um, no, I've, I've chosen to start an umbrella called the Australian Conservatives because I think it does embrace uh, most concepts and philosophies, and I think there's a, an opportunity to to merge a great many truly minor parties into that space. But if it means working as positively as I can with David Lionhelm and others, I certainly will do that at every single stage. So uh, Lee asks, while well, you've spoken about the problems with debt and large government this morning, as a libertarian with conservative inclinations, my observation of the conservative movement in Australia is that their drive of cash is that they prosecuting a cultural war and fighting the left, whereas issues around the size of government are a second priority. <laughs> What would you say to those of us libertarians who are sceptical of their commitment of conservatives to the causes of reducing the size and scope of government? I think you're right to be sceptical. But firstly, I make no apologies for fighting the culture war. I do think it is important. You, you can redress an economic balance sheet much more easily than you can a cultural balance sheet. And um, there are forces at work in our communities and our societies that are not in our long-term interest. Now, it might be not be convenient or politic to say that, but you know, I think we recognise it as conservatives. Um, but I'm appalled at the lack of commitment from those who are in parliament or in politics to reducing the size and scope and reach of government. They talk a good talk out there on the, on the playground and out in the field, but when it comes to actually kicking a goal, they resist it at every cause. I've had senior ministers say to me, that they were then in opposition, that the, the, the answer to housing unaffordability is to give more money to first home buyers. And when I asked them, well, what happens if we take what money we give them now? What would happen to house prices? Oh, they'd fall by more. And I say, but doesn't that make perfect sense? Stop giving them the money, the house prices will fall by more, they'll be cheaper. And he says, ah, oh, you couldn't do that. That would be terrible politically. Um, you know, that's the sort of commitment and enthusiasm for economic reform we have in elements of the government, and those people are now at the very highest levels of government. It, uh, it astounds me, and it's, uh, it's, I think, endemic or emblematic of the real problem that we face. Um, we've received a number of questions, all relating to your position on immigration and multiculturalism. Sure. I think I could potentially um, read all of them out, but I think just I can essentially, them. you I can, can probably them. predict them, but I think uh, Dr. Thrash's one sort of, you know, in a growing competitive, international economy, how can Australia reduce its immigration intake and remain internationally competitive would be sort of one strain of thought. And the others are your general views on just sort of multiculturalism in general. Well, I, firstly, I don't agree with multiculturalism. I think where we can be perfectly accepting of our differences, but we live in a country in which we do have a culture. Some people say, what is it or what is it? But it's evolved over a period of time. We have expectations about how a society functions and it has worked hitherto pretty well. We now have segmentation or fragmentation. We have the identity politics being played around the place. Whose rights should prevail over whose? And we've been forced to make determinations that I think are sometimes in our, not in our long-term interest. When it comes specifically to immigration, I make no bones about it. I think the immigration rate is too high in this country. Governments love high immigration because it boosts GDP figures. More people go out and buy coffees and more people go and buy widgets and they're going to, you know, purchase train tickets and all sorts of things like this. So the figures of the national economy grow. But when you break it down to a per capita uh, benefit or income for people, the immigration rate is far too high. And that's why there is a disconnection between the public who say there's something wrong in our society and there's, you know, I'm not feeling better off. It's because governments cannot keep up with infrastructure. They cannot keep up with the service demand. There are too many migrants that come here that remain on welfare for, a, a, you know, a too long a period of time. It's not because we're an anti-immigration state. It's that the man and woman in the street is not seeing the benefit of migration. So I think we need to halve migration. I think it needs to be uh, a skilled migration program, and it shouldn't be just about getting hairdressers and shoe shiners and things like that here. We need people who are going to come here and build businesses, generate employment, and, and you know, contribute as positively as they can. So I want immigration in Australia to act in our economic, our social, and our cultural interest, and I think that's what most Australians want to. Uh, we've also received a number of questions on marriage. I'll just choose one, which I'm I think reflects. I'm already married. 
which I think best reflects them. To, um, to protect the sanctity of marriage, would you support the removal of government from the affairs of individuals by removing the Marriage Act? Uh, this is the, is this from you, David Lyonheim? <laughs> Look, I know this is, this is um, one of the classic libertarian positions you get out of it, but, you know, I unashamedly, I support marriage as it is. I think, I think you know, the union of a man and a woman together in generally, for the purpose of, of raising children, is in society's best interest. Not because the, it's, 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 I don't want to denigrate any individual, but men and women play complementary but different roles in the raising of children, and I don't want to actively go out and deny that, notwithstanding the other circumstances that there are. It's also, it's a quite a simple thing. I'm not into the habit of redefining words. That's the process of the left. You know, marriage has been between a man and woman for time immemorial. If you want to call it something else, that's fine. We already don't have, you know, legal discrimination in that space. Um, you know, the left redefine words like savings. You know what savings means today? They mean tax increases. I don't want to redefine marriage. Look, there's no applause for that other side of it. Uh, a question from William. What do you think the solution is to parliamentarians who say in private they think one way, but publicly proclaim to believe another? Oh, I want to swear. Um, uh, you know, what can you do? Uh, you know, the only thing you can do is, is encourage them. You, you would not believe the battles that go on behind the scenes with people, even on getting some of my Senate colleagues to sign the uh, Reform of 18C Bill. I went to some of the most vocal proponents of uh, Reform of Section 18C, and they had to ponder whether they were going to sign it. Now, whether that was because of me or because of their careers or not, and in the end, I said to one of them, I said, if you don't sign this, I will make sure that the issue is not my bill, but the fact that you've said one thing and you've refused to do it. Um, you know, the choice is now yours. They signed it pretty quickly after that. Uh, but, you know, I don't, I'm not saying we should be, be very um, publicising private conversations, but I do think there is a, an integrity issue that people need to be reminded of their history and their track record. And in politics, this is what happens. The little carrot comes along. We're all the donkeys and the carrots there on the string. And they say, you know, if you shut up and you do this, you'll be parliamentary secretary for feeding chickens next week or something. <laughs> and they all shut up. I mean, I had Tony Abbott say around a, a table with 12 colleagues that I would be in cabinet if I'd stopped talking about the things that he so happens to be talking about now. But, um, you know. <laughs> uh, that's the, that, that, is, that is the modern process of politics. It is suspend your voice, your common sense, and you will get the rewards as you climb. And too many people now go straight from university into a staffer's job with the aim of getting into politics, climbing the greasy pole as strongly and quickly as they can. De the currency of that climb is their colleagues, and then they leave and say, haven't I done a great job? Um, I don't think that's in the best interest of our country. Um, a related question is uh, one of the perennial debates that we often have is you know, working within a major party to change it from the inside. I think change it from the inside has become sort of a, on internet forums, a sort of perennial punchline these days but in these debates. So what changed your mind and what made you think that you could no longer change the Liberal Party from the inside? Um, I've been in the parliamentary team for the Liberal Party for 10 years. I've fought, fought battles in the, in the Liberal Party for 30 years. Um, and I had a bit of time in America to see, to contemplate things, quite frankly. I had three months there. And I'm not going to say I was inspired by Donald Trump, but I saw how one man stood in the face of you know, great hostility, unbelievable hostility from his own colleagues. Uh, I think he was a Republican, really, wasn't he? But anyway. Um, <laughs> but from people within the Republican Party, uh, from the press and the media. And I sat there and watched it. And I was contemplating my own future and um, I rang my wife and said, uh, look, I can't stay in the position in which I'm in. Um, I'm beating my head against a wall. It's frustrating and I don't want to be forever known as a person who just, you know, reminded the Liberal Party from within what they should be doing and being the maverick and the rebel and, you know, however they want to characterise it. So I said, I've got two choices. I can leave politics or I can give a real crack to a different way. And she said, she said, well, if you leave politics, in 30 years' time, you'll be even crankier and grumpier than you are now. <laughs> and I'm not prepared to put up with that. So she says, um, 
you will regret it for the rest of your life if you don't give it a go. Uh, and that was the moment. I, I resolved, OK, this is fine. And yet I wasn't... There was always somewhere in the back of my mind over the subsequent months that things might change, things might get better, they might get differently. And I confided in some colleagues, some retained those confidences, some didn't. But um, in the end, I feel more liberated, more invigorated and more passionate about politics from where I am today than I've felt in the last uh, 10 years. And if nothing comes of what I'm doing, at least I'm giving it a crack. And uh, uh, who knows, it might turn out to be a splendid success or it might just be um, you know, something that's in the footnote of, uh, of, of history about this maverick, this rebel that sort of uh, you know, gave it a go. Um, we've to, uh, as a Muslim supporter of both you and Donald Trump, I get ostracised a lot for supporting figures such as you. How do you think we can find a balance between preventing radicalism within my community while also finding a balance between restricting our freedoms and overreach of the government into our private lives? Uh, it's, it's a really good question. Um, and, you know, I'm a supporter of freedom of religion. I, I, no one can ever point to anything where I haven't done that. But I do believe that there are there are aspects of, you know, culture that we need to preserve and protect in our country. People can are free to worship whomever they want in any manner they want, whether it be, you know, aliens or Allah or, you know, Buddha or Jesus, whatever. There are alien worshippers, by the way. <laughs> any here? Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, people are free to do that because you cannot, you cannot uh, put restrictions on thought. But what you can do is put restrictions on practices that are not consistent with our, our own legal framework or the cultural framework or the social expectations that we have of each other. And that means, I, you know, I cannot excuse ever, um, you know, some of the people who say that female genital mutilation is a reasonable thing to do. And it was only a few years ago we had Australian doctors saying, well, these people culturally want to do it, so let's just make it some sort of ritual medical procedure and satisfy their cultural demands. I think that's abhorrent. And the fact that, you know, our medical profession are even advocating that. Um, so we've got to stand firm. And so you can worship, you can, uh, you know, adore whomever you want to adore. But do not do it, do not enforce your obligations or you, what you think are your requirements against our laws and society. And to stand for that now is somehow to be deemed to be a racist or a bigot or something like that. To stand up for the traditions that give us the freedom that make people want to come to this country in the first place is somehow seen as, as narrow-minded or bigoted. I rejected it in its entirely. And unless you can have a conversation about this sort of thing, um, it will breed resentment and discontentment. And when I was in the States, uh, no, sorry, in England some years ago, to look at immigration patterns and cultural patterns, I warned them that if we couldn't have a conversation about some of the things that we were facing here that were exhibited overseas, we would find a major backlash. Uh, we're finding that a little bit, I think, in the Senate already um, and in minor parties. So, look, we can all coexist, but we've got to have the rule of law and a framework in which we all abide by. Um, thank you very much, Senator. That's all we have time for.